In this short video, I want to look at the role of a key organisation that's in the news a lot at the moment, that's our central bank, the Bank of England. What do they do and how effective has it been? So, in a nutshell, what is the purpose of having a central bank, a Bank of England? Well, going back to the original charter, 1694, now know ye that we being desirous to promote the public good and benefit of our people. Fantastic old fashioned language there to bring that up to date but maintain the spirit of the sentence from the current website. Their mission is to promote the good of the people, specifically by maintaining monetary and fiscal stability. So the bit we really want to focus on is there. Now they do some other things as well, which I'll look at at the end, but that is pretty key to the entire reason that the Bank of England as a separate central bank exists. And it does have its own governor, it has its own board, if you like, and it is, in theory, and hopefully in practice, free to make its own independent decisions about what we'll look at in a moment, separate from the government, separate from the treasury, and so on. Okay, so, monetary stability. What's all that about? Pretty, pretty crucial. The aim is to achieve what they call long-term economic stability, sustainable growth, and employment. So how do you do that? That sounds like a grand objective. Well, they've got a few uh, tools available, but not loads of tools available. They're looking to maintain stable prices, so they've set an inflation target, similar to the European target of 2%. So they're looking to aim, maintain sort of low and steady rates of inflation in the UK, and at the same time maintain confidence in the currency. And a currency is typically seen as a bellwether for the wider economy. So that's really their main focus, and then they let in that environment, companies and so on, and consumers do the rest. Main policy tool available is interest rates. In other words, how are you going to try and hit this inflation target? And by target, I mean they're, they're aiming to keep inflation sort of at or below that level. Well, interest rates are the main tool we have available, but a few years ago, they embarked on something brand new that's been adopted all around the world by some big central banks since, and that's quantitative easing, or QE. So they kind of supplemented their main policy tool with a second one. So let's take a look at both of those. First of all, interest rates. Now, <clears throat> for novices, what's the idea? How can you control the overall stability and growth and sort of happiness of an economy just using one tool, which is the bank rate? And here's the theoretical answer. The economy starts to slow growth rates start to slow down, GDP starts to slow, the economy starts to contract, what do you do? Well, the idea is that as the economy contracts, prices will start to fall away, all right? Because people will stop spending, they'll start saving, businesses will stop investing, they'll start saving. So essentially, prices will fall away, inflation picks that up as either the RPI, that's the old inflation measure, or the CPI, deal with those in another video, by the way, and as a response, the bank lowers its interest rate. And we'll see just how far it's lowered it in a moment. Result, hopefully. Now, the problem with all these policy tools is it takes a while to take effect. So it is literally, hopefully, the result is this. The cost of borrowing falls for consumers and businesses. Why? Deal with this in more detail in another video. But essentially, the bank rate directly influences the rate that commercial banks charge to lend to each other and offer on deposit. It directly affects your mortgage rate, directly affects what you can earn on your savings, it affects the rate that companies can borrow at and earn money on deposits at, and so on. So, the bank lowers its own interest rate, the cost of borrowing for consumers and businesses drops. The idea is supposed to be firms then think, great, this is a brilliant time to borrow money because it's cheap and get out there and invest and try and expand our businesses. In order for that to happen, so you don't end up with huge overcapacity in the economy, you know, too many firms making too many things. At the same time, consumers get their mojo back, if you like. Consumers start thinking, oh, cheap loans, you mean I can borrow again, start spending, all right? <clears throat> also, if you lower the interest rate, probably the savings rate you're getting on your bank account drops away as well, so you're kind of encouraged to spend more money. And the idea is supposed to be in a virtuous circle. Those two things kickstart economic growth. Very crude, that diagram, but that's the basic idea. And then you've got to watch out because as the economy starts to revive, prices start to move up, 
because consumers start spending, competing for goods and services, then the bank's got to keep his eye on the inflation rate again, <clears throat> which will now be rising and possibly respond by lifting that bank rate and sort of dampening some of that demand. So there's your basic mechanics. Now, as you probably know, the economy has gone through quite a period of sort of stagnation. We had the big credit crisis and so on the last few years. So not surprisingly, the direction of interest rates from the Bank of England has been one way and it's down. And they basically cut rates some time ago to about as low as they can possibly cut them. With a bank rate of only half a percent, there's not much more room on the downside to go. And this just shows you the bank rate over time. And you can say, well, that's the lowest rate since 1965. You can go further than that. You can take the bank rate way back centuries and you'll struggle to find a period where the bank rate's been any lower. So they've, they've pushed that button almost as hard as they can. They've dropped interest rates. And a few years ago, sensing that that might not be enough, they then pulled another lever. Quantitative easing, as it's grandly called. Now don't panic and turn off the video, it's a pretty horrible term. I'm going to summarise it in a nutshell for anyone who's not sure what they're trying to do here. So they've dropped interest rates. Done. All right, now what? The idea is that quantitative easing, in a nutshell, was the bank deciding to buy financial assets, mainly government-issued IOUs. Now remember, we're saying that the Independent Bank of England is separate from the government, so it can go out, create money electronically, and use it to buy government assets from the people who've currently got them, pension funds, life assurance companies, and so on. So the idea was it went out and snaffled up £375 billion pounds worth in total over a series of chunks, of government IOUs primarily, could have bought other things, could have bought other bonds, for example, but mainly IOUs. The programme was stopped a few years back. That's not true of all central banks, by the way, like the American one, for example, the Fed. But we stopped our programme a few years back, and so far <coughs> the lever hasn't been pushed back. In other words, QE was done, and nothing's been done yet to reverse it, for we know we might get even more of it in the future. It's one of those levers that could be pulled again. So, out on the right-hand side, the aim. Why would you do that? The aim, push up the price of gilts, diagram coming in a moment, and lower yields. The idea is that the people who've got these things think, well, that's rubbish. I don't want to hold something with a low yield. So they'll happily give up those IOUs, those assets, and buy assets that have got a higher, better return on them. So they'll switch funds into other corporate bonds and shares. That supports new issuance of those securities, reduces borrowing costs for consumers at the same time. Why? Because the yield, I'll call it a benchmark, the yield on some of these IOUs, government IOUs, is directly linked to the price that you pay to borrow if you're a mortgage holder, for example, or if you're looking for a, for a loan. You get asset price inflation, house price inflation, equities rise, people feel a bit more confident, they start spending, and Bob's your uncle. So low interest rates plus this asset purchase program together get the economy going, is the theory. Now, that's a lot of words, so if you prefer to see it this way, put the Bank of England at the top, all right? Basically, it approaches the people who've got these IOUs, these gilts, let's say, and it's primarily gilts they've been buying, so pension funds, life assurers, and other financial institutions. It says, right, sell a load of those to us, so it prints money, all right? Buys up loads of those IOUs. Result, okay, well, the cash that these people have now got one theory says, goes into the banking system because they've swapped their gilts for cash. They've got to do something with it, got to sit, put it under the mattress. So they pump it into the banks and the banks can then start lending people like you and me more money. I'm not sure that's worked out quite the way it was intended to because what some of the banks have just done is go, thank you for the cash. We'll just hold that because we're a bit scared at the moment that we'd like to repair our own balance sheets. So maybe over here, we're not seeing a huge effect from QE if I'm going to give it a bit of a personal view. But over on the right-hand side, Basically, pension funds and life assurers might use the cash not to put it into a bank account, but to buy other bonds, buy other shares, corporate bonds, corporate shares, boost borrowing and spending on the corporate side of the economy, boost asset prices, which is good news for both companies and consumers, and at the same time, as I mentioned, lower yield. By buying gilts, you squash the yield, and that has a ripple effect in terms of yields right out across the spectrum other assets and other loans and so on. There's the idea in very brief summary. Now, <clears throat> has it worked? Jury's still out, all right, but one comment I would make, just one comment, there are plenty others, but here's probably the main one. In an attempt to revive growth, which I've called nominal GDP, but you can just you can cross that out and call it growth, you've got two options, says the theory, okay? You 
either boost the supply of money or you increase the speed with which it whizzes around the economy. Right? It's not about just creating money, it's about getting people to spend it, borrow it, move it around, trade with each other. QE, by printing money, essentially deals with that bit. More money in the economy. Okay? Creates an almost out of thin air, if you like, electronic money. But it doesn't do anything for the velocity. You can't force people to borrow money. You can't force people to spend money. In other words, you can't change the demand side of the equation. You can't make consumers go out and start borrowing and spending. You can just try and create an environment in which hopefully they will. So that's the, probably the biggest single weakness of this sort of pushing on a string approach to monetary policy. Okay, other key roles, and then we'll wrap up. The Bank of England's main role, as I said, a very important one, gets all over the newspapers at the moment, brokers commenting on it, is that management of interest rates plus QE to try and revive growth at the time this video is being made, to early 2015. Other roles, they do maintain the supply and security of banknotes. They've been the main issuer for some time, responsible for the design, distribution and withdrawal, and making sure they're secure, making sure they don't get too manky in circulation, so pulling them out of circulation, pumping new ones back in. The printer is actually a commercial company called De La Rue, but that is all part and parcel of the Bank of England's sort of day-to-day -day management of the stability of the currency role, you can see it that way, yeah, making sure they're difficult to forge and all that kind of good stuff. And over on the right, massive role, but not one I'm going to focus on in this video in much detail, financial stability, which means the regulation of banks, building societies, insurers, okay, and making sure through the rules that they set that there is effective competition and a fair deal for consumers, however you choose to define that. They also supervise some of the plumbing that backs up all the stuff that goes on in the city. Um, this is kind of the boring but important stuff. Settlement systems, that's once a share deal's been done, making sure that legal ownership is successfully transferred from seller to buyer, and so is the cash. And central counterparties are sort of invisible as far as most retail investors are concerned, but they sit behind all the deals that go on in the city, or a lot of them, making sure that neither party pulls out suddenly and defaults, which would trigger a collapse of confidence, transaction volumes are full, and so on and so forth. So there you have it, a whirlwind tour of what I see as the key role of the Bank of England, monetary um, stability, okay, financial stability, with a flavour for one or two of their other key roles thrown in. More on central banks in future videos.